Folks, we appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football. And when we bring in this guy, we know football is right around the corner. Steve Merrill of Wager Talk. Got to lock it in with Wager Talk and Steve's selections there. Not just college football. It's, of course, the NFL starting soon. The NBA Major League Baseball going on right now, taking you into the MLB playoffs and just everything imaginable there with Steve. And Steve, it's great to see you. Glad to have you back. And uh, I just discovered in reviewing some things the other day that this will be your sixth season with wow. us. Not bad. And uh, yeah, I joked earlier. It's like, I see Mark Rogers on my screen. It must be football season. But that wasn't fair to you because you are 366 <laughs> days a year this year with the leap year college football, of course. Uh, but it is true with myself. I I'm a full-time football handicapper this fall. But NBA playoffs a few months ago, Major League Baseball this summer. So I'm just getting my feet wet right now with the college football season. And full transparency, I used to dive in in July, you know, early August. I do so a little less now just because the transfer portal, it's crazy. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a Washington fan. I think he told me they have one returning starter. Is that right this year, Mark? Technically that one returning correct. starter at Wazoo. Um, it just shows the world we're living in now. It's a different type of handicap. Um, I think futures are still, there's some value with the futures, with the Heisman, the conference, you know, the national championship odds. Um, but it's definitely a different handicap until we see something on the field. And unlike the NFL, which still has a limited preseason, we get no preseason in college football. Um, you know, week one is the show and it's here in a couple of weeks. Interesting to note uh, a couple of stats to throw at you, Steve, one that I've been tracking for years. So I noticed about seven or eight years ago that the preseason publications, Street and Smith, Lindy's, Athlon's, they do a tremendous job of presenting information. However, their predictions were too conservative. <laughs> so I thought they look too conservative. Let's see if they are. And I started a track where they would only have about six or seven teams each season that would have a drastic increase or decrease in regular season wins. And I set the bar at three thinking, okay, that's a significant change. If you go, let's say from six and six to nine and three or from 10 and two to seven and five, that's a significant increase or decrease in wins. Steve, you can bank on it between 18 to 22 of the 70 power five teams will have an increase or decrease in wins from one year to the other of at least three. Last season, it was 26 of 70. So more than a third of the sport had a drastic increase or decrease in wins. A just completely different football team the next year. And I think that's surprising to most people because we look at the top of the sport Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia, that doesn't change, but the rest of the landscape is in flux from year to year. Yeah, and I, I can tell you right now how much I stock I put in the magazines nowadays. I have a barrel of magazines from the 90s when I started. This will be my 29th football season as a full-time professional handicapper. I started in August of 1996, so I started 28 years ago this month. This will be my 29th season coming up, and I had four or five different magazines from every year in the 90s kind of tapered off a little in the 2000s. I don't even buy them anymore um, because for the reasons you're talking about, first of all, they're not accurate. I was never using it for the predictions. I was using it more for the information. And now with the internet, it's so easy to get this information than it was in the 90s. But you're right. Uh, you know, Basically, they're using different writers for each conference. Uh, they're looking at last year's results. It's harder than ever now with the turnover and the transfer portal to predict what a team's going to be like until we see them actually play. Um, so I'd be very careful with those publications. And if they and keep in mind for shelf life, they got to get them out in June or July at the latest now, which means they have to write them in May or June. Half these guys aren't even on those teams by July anymore. So um, it's tricky for the online publications. It's tricky for the magazines. A uh, Mark Lawrence playbook is a great one from a sports betting side. I did a college football preview article for about a decade in that. Um, I've stopped doing it the last couple of years. I uh, basically told him it's just too difficult to write that up the first week of May. Um, it's not doing the readers any service. So it's interesting that you did that back test, but it does not surprise me. I also did a back test for the three previous seasons with the AP poll just being released this week of the 75 teams, 25, 25, 25, the last three seasons, 23, 22, and 21. Of those 75 in the preseason AP top 25, they only hit on 39 of the final 75. So wow. barely half of their selections make it all the way to the finish line as a top 25 team. In fact, Steve, in 2022 and 2021, nine of the 20 teams in the final top 20 or the final top 10 in those two seasons, nine of them were unranked to start the season. Right. And a lot of the reason, of course, with football is because 
it's a 12 game season now it used to be 11 you know one or two games can drastically change if you make a ranking or not if you make a bowl or not if you have a winning season or a losing season and as you know mark i mean just a couple extra turnovers in a game can make a misleading result so i really do think you want to take a contrarian view from season to season and that sets up some you know overrated and underrated teams coming in um now it has gotten a little trickier once again because you can basically reload we talk about washington they're in the national championship and they technically have one returning starter which is extremely misleading because they've got a lot of experience i'm sure coming in um but it's a great study i, I love it it doesn't surprise me and it would be interesting to see how many of the top 10 they get right you know even in the top 10 like those teams are probably still ranked but i wonder how many of those top 10 were still in the top 10 when the season ended that'd be very interesting to go back and check as well we posted that video this week as well. Last season, it was only USC at number six that finished unranked. Other seasons, it was as many as four of the top four. 10 teams in the country. Wow. And you got to figure Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State have been so rock solid that those are kind of three automatics that you could put in every year, and you're going to get those right. Uh, so it even shows how much in flux the rest of the situation in college football has been uh, for the last seven or eight years. All right, Steve, uh, do we want to look at the win totals uh, in regards to what Vegas is projecting there? I got to say that I think that uh, I've got a pretty decent beat on the sport when I make my win total projections and then I compare them to Vegas and I think I don't have too many <laughs> discrepancies with Vegas. Uh, I our, our friends at Iowa, they come to mind, though. They're sitting at seven and a half. And um they look like a good play to me to to finish well above seven and a half wins in particular. But take us in whatever direction you'd like concerning win totals coming up this fall. Yeah, by the way, Iowa State also seven and a half. So it's going to be interesting to see how those two teams fare. Um, first of all, college win totals. And once again, to show how the landscape has changed the last 29 seasons, I've been a professional handicapper. Back in the 90s when I started I would purposely fly out to Vegas uh, late July, early August. And here again, I was doing my work a lot earlier, as I mentioned back then, because I would fly out to the Imperial Palace, which no longer exists, to play their season win totals, uh, their over-unders. They were one of the few books, if the only book, to put up college football win totals back in the 1990s. And keep in mind, when I talked about put up win totals, they had them on maybe 15 teams at most. It was the powerhouse teams, like the top 20 teams only. And the IP is no longer there. Jay Cornegy was ahead of his time. He's been ahead of the Westgate over um, when, you know, the Westgate NFL contest on the strip, right off the strip there. Uh, the sportsbook manager for the Superbook there for over a decade now. And one of the things I loved about college football win totals versus the NFL version, I still like the NFL win totals, is that unlike the NFL, basically on any given Sunday, somebody can beat the other team. And when you're handicapping back then 16 games, you had a couple that were maybe an 80% play that you kind of knew who the winner was going to be, but they were all theoretically at play still. That's not the case with college football, especially back then when I was only looking at the top 20 teams. We were handicapping 11 games back then. You know, a powerhouse like, say, Alabama nowadays was going to be a monster favorite in five, six, seven, eight of those games. There's about a 90% chance they were going to win at least. So you only had to really handicap two or three games out of the 11. It's the same thing now with 12 games, the little trickier. And I do think there's more parity now in college football, but college football win totals can provide a lot of opportunity because it comes down to really just getting three or four games correct in the handicap. And also nowadays, another advantage we have, Mark, is that they have advanced lines like the Westgate, for example, and a lot of other books. They have every single NFL line out for every week of the season already, a bettable line. So you can look at the math and figure out what the odds are to win every single game. College football, they have a lot of the big games out here. So you can do that as well with some of the big top 20 teams. Um, I will say this. I've talked about this for about a month now. A lot of heavy, sharp money is on the Michigan under. I know you got to do a lot of Big Ten coverage here on the Voice of College Football. Uh, that opened as high as eight and a half, nine. It's been bet down to eight now in a lot of locations. You got the defending undefeated national champs projected to lose at least four games now by the sharp betters. So uh, that is one that took a lot of under sharp money. Uh, Mississippi State has also taken some under sharp money this season for their season wins. Uh, people are fading Mississippi State. And once again, anybody betting this in June, July, or August is probably sharp professional money because you're tying your money up for five or six months. This isn't your average weekend better. And as far as an over bet, Boise State is getting a lot of love. And we'll talk more about them with some of the conference odds and even the national championship odds. But Boise State over, Mississippi State under and Michigan under are three of the sharp money moves we've seen over the past month. And just keep in mind, when playing win totals, 
you always want to kind of lean towards the under, especially in the NFL where the quarterback position is so key because everything is priced to play out like it should. And if you get a key injury in football, especially at the quarterback position, that could be a couple more wins. So once again, there's more downside risk to an under or ra rather to an over because there's more opportunity for an under to hit if there's an injury. So you usually see more sharp money on the under Michigan, Mich Mississippi State. Uh, but the Sharps do like Boise State over for, as well for season wins. Appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football, joined by Steve Merrill. Wagertalk.com is the place to be for Steve's look at all the major sports all year round. And of course, college football heating up here in just about 10 days with our first week zero game, Florida State and Georgia Tech. Then, of course, the full schedule in week one. And we will have Steve on here each and every week going over all the big games, including Steve's under the radar selection. 21 and five. Woo. Check the math on that one. 21 and five against the spread. Folks, if you know anything, anything about this process, that is crazy good. 21 and five against the spread. I, I like, you know, stick out my chest once in a while at 58 or 59% against the spread. But uh, Steve is hitting on 21 and out of 26 the last two seasons. So we won't keep him up to that standard, but who knows? He's he's capable of anything, but he has his under-the-radar selection. It's exclusive here at the Boys of College Football. We will have that selection for you here in the next few days as a YouTube member. All right, Steve, uh, should we go through the conferences? Sure. And uh, you can tee them up in whatever order that you've got them in front of you there. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll hit some of the big boys. I know you have some ACC viewers here on the channel. Um, we're checking the ACC odds. Not a surprise, Clemson's about a 3-1 to one favorite. But the other team that's right up there with them at 3-1 to one is Florida State. And then you've got Miami of Florida at 4-1. to one. Um, The other the only other teams in single digits, once again, Louisville, NC State, Virginia Tech, all around the 8-1 to one range. So the ACC is pretty open. I mean, we've obviously seen Clemson become beatable, Mark, the last several seasons. And Florida State start to improve their program back to that national title standard. Um, so right now, uh, the ACC looks like maybe one of the most competitive conferences this year. I mean, you've got six teams right now listed less than 10 to 1, which is pretty unusual. And I believe the win totals for Florida State, Miami, and Clemson are nearly identical. Uh, there's, a, there's a shift in odds. The odds are a bit different for each team that makes Florida State, I believe, the favorite, uh, if I recall. Yeah, right around uh, nine and a half for Florida State flat. So you're looking at Florida State about nine and a half wins. And then um, Clemson, you're looking at nine to the over. So you're right. When you factor in the juice, uh, Florida State slightly ahead, which is interesting because, as I said, the conference odds are pretty much even. Yeah, like you said, Mark, Clemson's about a half a game up, maybe a quarter game up as far as season wins. Folks, if you know anything about betting, basically you're going to see the number minus 110 next to a lot of games. And that means it's even money on both sides. Uh, so you have to spend $110 to make 100 in return if you uh, get the, the wager right. What I have noticed, Steve, with these wins totals is very few are close to even money. Vegas is very much encouraging the play on one side or the other. What, what factors into that? Well, yeah, it's, they're not encouraging the play. It's just the way the money's coming in. And not only that, you know, sometimes it, it'll open juiced one way or the other. And it's not because Vegas likes one side or the other. It's because every half game, as you can imagine, Mark, is worth a tremendous amount. First of all, the NFL, every half game could be worth as much as 50 cents in that money line that you're talking about. And they play 17 games. We're talking about a 12-game season. So the difference between nine and nine and a half is substantial, right? Because – at nine and a half, you've got to go 10 and two or better to win now with the over. Whereas at nine, you have to go nine and three just to push or win. So it, it's a big difference. That half game can be worth as much as 50 cents. The difference between nine and a half and eight and a half can be worth up to 100 cents, which means if it's at a pick em price at nine and a half, you might have to lay minus 200 to go over eight and a half instead. So um, it, it's more just the fact that every half game matters more than it does on a normal point spread. And you're going to see a substantial move on the juice because they don't want to move on and off. And the other thing I'll point out is that in an ideal world, we see this in the NFL. Almost all the NFL games are half games because they don't want to hide the money tied up for six months and then have to refund a push. So they want to try to have eight and a halves and nine and a halves and ten and a halves, for example. And then the market moves it and we'll see some money come in. For example, 
Michigan is still under nine in some spots, but it's minus 150, minus 180, minus 200 because they've been getting so many under bets on the under nine. Um, sometimes they will move it down to eight and a half at that point, but every half game is very valuable with these season win totals. Yeah, and just to frame uh, your example another way, if you've got that nine and a half, yes, that team needs to go 10 and two for you to win that bet. If it just drops to nine, look at it this way, you don't lose unless that team goes eight and four. Eight and four, exactly. So, yeah, that, so. That's, that's a two-game difference between not losing money, basically. So it's a substantial difference. Uh, Ohio State's a big favorite nationally, uh, and they have – they get to talk like they are the favorite in the Big Ten, but I've seen a lot of FPI and a lot of odds that favor Oregon. Much of that comes because Ohio State travels to Oregon and what could be the game that shakes out the Big Ten, and obviously they've got to play a championship game, which may be a rematch uh, between those two. So Ohio State, Oregon, and then maybe some, some love for the likes of Penn State on the side. Yeah, excellent point. This is kind of goes back to what I was talking about as far as handicapping those season win totals, right? You can isolate two or three games for these powerhouse teams like Oregon, Ohio State that matter. And, and this is a perfect example of that as far as the conference odds go. Uh, both of them are less than two to one in a lot of different sports books to win the Big Ten, which means um, it's a two-way race. Penn State around five to one and then Michigan at eight to one. And once again, I've already talked about how the sharp money has been anti-Michigan. Um, keep in mind, too, with these future odds, when I'm saying Michigan's eight to one, they're not letting you take the other side that they don't win the Big Ten at minus nine hundred plus eight hundred. They do. It's basically just a yes bet. So the true odds probably should be fifteen to one or twenty to one. Um, they skew a lot of these. In fact, they skew all of them, and that's why I don't play a lot of these future odds because first of all, you're tying your money up for six months, and there's a huge house edge built in. In fact, good textbook example once again here. If you have an opinion on Ohio State or Oregon to win this conference. Why play them at plus 150 or plus 180 and tie your money up for six months? Just use that opinion on the game itself, right? Because like you said, Mark, whoever wins that game probably wins this conference. And, um, you know, you also, you know, if an injury happens or something, you don't have to worry about it. You just pass on the game itself. So I really think it'll be Ohio State or Oregon, and I think the winner of that game, like you said, probably will be the determining factor. Uh, the Big 12, I'm going to be interested to hear how you size up those odds because that conference is a free-for-all. On any given week, you can pretty much it's, – it's almost like a bell curve. You can take the top 10 or 20 percent, and uh, which would be Utah, basically, and if you believe in Kansas State and Oklahoma State, and then you take the bottom 10 or 20 percent, pretty much everybody in the middle, and in, even including those top three teams, it's a coin flip pretty much. It's a 60-40 kind of game – every game, almost every game in the Big 12. Yeah, I mean, you look at a team like Kansas State, their season win total, now it's juiced to the under. It's still nine and a half, you know, so that's that's a team that could very well go 10 and two this year. So they're going to be in play. Uh, you mentioned Utah. Utah always seems to be a nice money maker. ever since Urban Meyer was there a couple decades ago. They've always been a team that makes money. Uh, they're nine and a half to the over. They're almost priced at 10. So there's a really good chance uh, Utah could actually go 11 and one in this conference. Uh, we see them at about a three to one favorite. Kansas State's about three and a half to one. And then after that, you start to see a drop off with Iowa State, Oklahoma State at eight to one, Arizona, Kansas, UF, uh, Central Florida, 10 to one. So it looks like it's a two horse race with Utah and Kansas State. It'll probably come down to one of those two, but this is a brand new Big 12 conference. Um, teams are going to have to play in the altitude of Utah. That's something else I want to point out, Mark, that could be an underrated factor. I use this a lot in handicapping college basketball we also use it in football in fact if you blindly play against teams that play in colorado whether it be the rockies the broncos or the avalanche blindly playing against those teams or the non out the non-altitude team the next game they have a letdown it's a winning play so altitude's a real factor and i would lean towards utah to win this conference just because they're going to have some home games against teams that probably aren't used to it interesting moving from the big 12 we'll wrap up with the sec in terms of the conference odds uh, of course, Georgia is the favorite to win the national championship. Uh, Alabama is a lowly number five team in the country right now by their standards. Uh, that's their lowest preseason ranking since 2009. Uh, really, the schedule analysis, of course, comes into play because these are not NFL schedules that are, of course, right. there are advantages and disadvantages to the NFL schedule, but nowhere close to college. So, for example, Steve, I analyzed the Oklahoma schedule versus the Texas schedule Oklahoma is playing a composite SEC schedule that is 36 and 20 from last season. 
Texas's composite schedule from last season in the SEC, 19 and 37. They are basically an antithesis. You can take the second best team on Texas's schedule, Texas A&M in the SEC, and they are arguably the second worst on Oklahoma's schedule. That's how much uh, the schedule analysis obviously comes into play. Yeah, to put it in perspective, Oklahoma right now priced at seven and a half, slightly to the over for season wins. Texas Longhorns ten and a half for their season wins. <laughs> so that's a tremendous difference there. Now there has been a lot of money actually on the Texas under ten and a half. In fact, um, some spot, many spots have dropped to ten already. Uh, it's about over minus two hundred juice to the under. So Longhorns really true win totals probably ten, even though it opened ten and a half. We have seen some money on the under ten and a half there. Um, Alabama is interesting to talk about nine and a half for their win total. And you reference that they're not even in the top two for favorites in this conference. You've got Georgia two to one, Texas three to one, Bama over six, even seven to one in some spots. In fact, Ole Miss and Bama are kind of tied around seven to one in that third spot in the conference. And then you got LSU at eight to one. Everybody after those five teams are 15 or 20 to one to hire. So it's a five team race, most likely. It's hard to go against Georgia. They're a powerhouse program. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, their season win total, I believe, when I last checked, was the highest in the nation. We'll see where it stands now. It's still at um, a 10 and a half juice to the over. So they're basically like an 11. But the Utah Utes that we just talked about, they're also juiced over 10 and a half. So Utah and Georgia really could project to be the two best teams record-wise in college football this season. And that's even with Georgia taking three difficult trips right. to Ole Miss, Bama, and Texas. And they also have the Clemson neutral site. Yeah, it's a hellacious schedule. I think they're the most talented team, um, but they're going to probably have a hiccup. I, I think over 10 and a half with juice is risky because you're saying they have to go one loss only for you to cash. And you just mentioned three or four possible losses, even though they won't lose all those games. They could win them all. Um, I think Georgia 10 and a half is probably priced to perfection. Yeah, moving on to the national championship odds, we'll stay right there with Georgia because obviously they are a huge favorite. Uh, the AP and the coaches poll both have them with about four or five times as many number one votes as Ohio State, who's really the only one receiving votes. It's pretty much those two. Uh, it's interesting to note that only 11 teams that have been voted preseason number one since 1950. So 72, 73 football seasons, only 11 made it from number one to finish number one in the country. And uh, so we've got uh, Georgia, Ohio State, then it seems to somewhat fall off the table. Love it. You stole my thoughts. I was going to ask you if you dug deep into the number one ranking, and um, that's about where I would have thought it was. That's 15%, by the way. And I know it's kind of the same with college basketball as well, uh, that we don't see the number ones go door to door, obviously. Now, football, it's interesting because it's a shorter season, less games. You would think it would happen a bit more. Um, here's the thing about the future odds, though. Drastically different now than we've had in years past, right? I mean, when I started back in the 90s, it was basically just a couple of teams. And then obviously the four-team playoff um, has come into fruition in the last decade or so. Now we're talking about basically, what is it, 12 teams? You know, so Georgia's almost a lock, in my opinion, to be in the 12, even if they lose a couple of those games that we mentioned. And then it's a it's an elimination, basically. So you have to kind of start by who you think could be in the mix and then take it from there. That We don't know what the matchups are going to be. We don't know who's going to play each other. I mentioned at the top of the show, I thought that Boise State was getting some sharp money, not only in their conference futures, but they're also getting some sharp money in the national championship odds. And the reason being because they have a good chance of making it with a weaker conference. Um, so I think when you're looking at these championship odds, you want to look for some flyers that aren't at the top of the list because you know, you're know you tying your money up even longer than the season win totals or the conference totals. You're tying it up for another month or so because everything plays through December before they get to the championship. So Georgia at less than three to one, I just don't feel like the risk reward is worth to tie your money up for six or seven months. Same with Ohio State at four to one. So kind of like the Heisman odds, which we'll also talk about, you're better off going down the list. Now, I don't think Boise State's going to win the national title. I don't think any of these long shots are going to win the national title. But the point is, once they get into that playoff format, you can probably start to hedge. And if you look at some of the future odds now, Clemson, 40 to one. You know, once again, they probably don't win the whole thing, but they have a chance to be there. They're one of the co-favorites to win their conference. Uh, Miami of Florida, 35 to 1. They're also up there to win their conference. Um, I think that's the way to play this. Kansas State, 75 to 1. We talked about they're one of the co-favorites to win their conference. So there's a lot of teams that can kind of get in there. Utah's 50 to 1. Um, and Utah might have the most wins in college football this year in the regular season. So 
I think you have to have a game plan maybe to play some long shots, but then be flexible enough to be able to hedge once you get that team in the playoff format and then kind of, you know, look for one of the big boys to win it like Ohio State or Georgia. But I would not tie my money up at three to one with Georgia. I would look for some long shots and then be ready to hedge out of it once the playoffs start. If you let that sink in, the the proportionate numbers that you just threw out there of being a three to one or four to one Ohio State right. Georgia versus a fringe top team that's at 50 or 60 or 70 to one. That's that's an incredible difference. It is, and it's unlike years past where they had to sneak in the top four, right? It's yep. it's not really the top twelve. I mean, what what is it? Maybe how many automatic the top bids, eleven right? plus yeah. plus one, 40. right? <laughs> so, 40. I mean, and, and let me get your take on this, Mark. I mean, who's your plus one? I'll pull up those odds for you. Uh, the plus one, I think Boise State would be my number one choice. Memphis would be in the mix, and Liberty are the first three teams that come to mind as having a shot. So Boise right now, 500 to one. So, I mean, they're again, they're not going to win it, but they get in that 12 team mix. I'm pretty confident no matter what the odds are in that first playoff game that we can hedge out at 500 to one, right? You know, and then probably lock in a profit. Um, you mentioned Memphis well, and Liberty as well. I mean, Liberty has been a powerhouse team at the mid-level recent years. They're 1500 to one. Um, Memphis is 2000 to one. I really think it's an interesting strategy because, and the other beauty about this strategy is that you're not having to tie much money up at 2001 on Memphis. You put a couple of dollars on that and then hedge out six months from now. If they don't make it. They don't make it. But um, this could be an interesting strategy to follow. I'm not saying that the books are sleeping on this, but it is new to everybody. And I'm not sure a lot of people are thinking this way yet. Steve Merrill, wager talk, wager talk.com is the place to be for Steve's selections, uh, not just covering college football. It's the NFL, of course, starting up. It's Major League Baseball, the NBA, everything involved right there. Um, Steve, before we let you go, would love to look at the Heisman odds if you have them there. Of course, last year's winners off to the NFL and Jaden Daniels. Most of the top contenders are off to the NFL. And this has always been for me, of course, it's gone from a running back award in the 70s and 80s to a quarterback award because the game has changed in regards to the dominance of that position. And then it's also about... Is the team winning? Is that player putting up statistics? And are they going to have a moment or two that kind of captures everyone's imagination uh, at some point in the season, whether that's a ridiculous catch or that's a game-winning drive by a quarterback against a top opponent? Well, the biggest thing, like you said, is that you have to look at the quarterbacks. And 15 of the last 18 have been quarterbacks, uh, and the other three have been offensive players. So I know we all remember the – Charles, you know, the Woodson Award back in the day when he won it as a D-back, uh, it's not going to happen. It's very unlikely. And, and we live in a pass-heavy offensive game more than ever. That's the other reason quarterbacks are running away with it. In fact, two of those other three non-quarterbacks were running backs, which makes sense. You could still maybe see a running back. We did get Devonta Smith in 2020 when he was a receiver from Alabama, but that was also the shortened season. It was a bizarre season. And we had Alabama. I believe they had the two quarterback situations, so if I'm not mistaken. So – you know, it's going to be a quarterback this year. It's really 15 of the last 18. Um, by the way, Caleb Williams won it two years ago. And you talked about how USC was the only top 10 team not to finish ranked last year. It's amazing how the Heisman winners don't do well in bowl games. They don't do well in the NFL in general. And we saw the team itself not do well last year. Now, Jaden Daniels won it for LSU uh, last year. It won't affect this year's team. Um, but, yeah, the quarterback – it's a quarterback-heavy list once again. Dylan Gabriel, the quarterback from Oregon, is the favorite at most books right now, as low as 6-1. to one. Carson Beck, 7-1. to one. Uh, Ears, 10-1. to one. Jackson Dart, 12-1. to one. Will Howard, 12-1. to one. Jalen Milrow, 13-1. to one. So, a lot of parity there in the list. I will say this. It's not only a quarterback award, but it's also a long-shot award. And I use this, uh, this story quite often when we talk about it. About a decade or so ago – in the end of November, the last week of the regular season in November, Andrew Luck was like one to 100, risk 100 to win a dollar. And RG3, Robert Griffin the third was like 100 to one, and he went on to win it still. Um, Cam Newton was not even listed in a lot of those preseason annuals that we talked about the year he won it. He wasn't even on the depth chart in some of the magazines in June, and he won it that year. Probably couldn't even find odds on him at the time until later in the season. Um, we often see guys come out of nowhere to win this award. So you, the last thing you want to do is to play a favorite and you do not want to tie your money up. 
Uh, we had Caleb Williams as a heavy favorite last year. He did not even repeat. Um, so once again, it's kind of like the national title futures. If you're going to tie your money up for five, six months, play a long shot. Um, so I will ask you, Mark, because you are the voice of college football. Give me someone I didn't mention there, maybe a long shot a little further down the list. Yeah, when you put all that framework together, what immediately came to me. So the coach has a track record of developing quarterbacks into Heisman Trophy winners. Caleb Williams being the most recent. He's got a quarterback in Miller Moss who threw six touchdown passes and almost 400 yards in the bowl game. They're going to be pass happy. Uh, and maybe Miller Moss down the list could be a potential surge. I like it. You're getting 40 to one right now in Miller Moss. So it's not a bad call. He is the first guy that comes to mind. Drew Aller, Penn State, 25 to 2 TD to pick ratio. Should have another really good team. They are projected by most to go to the college football playoff. Had a really good season, faltered against Ohio State and Michigan. Should have better pieces around him to possibly pull off uh, those games this year. Yeah, 35 to 1 right there. So you're getting a 35 to 1 and a 40 to 1. Sprinkle a little bit on both of them. It's a nice little risk to reward. And uh, that makes a lot of sense where you're going with that. You've got two teams that have the potential to be really good teams that also can put up some points and some yardage. Steve, we appreciate you being here. Everybody catch Steve's work at wagertalk.com. And Steve is going to join us each and every week for his under the radar selection plus analysis of all the big games across college football, starting with week one. And we so much appreciate Steve doing this for us. Steve, thanks uh, for being here. I love getting that uh, overview of the season. And uh, again, we appreciate you doing this and uh, great to see you. Yeah, Mark, always enjoy talking college football with you. Looking forward to the season.